Hello everyone, we're going to be discussing today about test crosses and sex linkage in the genetic section, two of the things that people find most difficult in the GCSE biology course. Now, I have put a few other videos online just for this section. Now, one of those videos then is uh, pea plant genetics, which is Solomon McGregor Mendel and his famous experiments to do with pea plants and how that teaches us in a bit about uh, genetics and monohybrid crosses. Then I put on a little, little animated video which talks about then eye colour and how you can use eye colour as an example of monohybrid inheritance. Now, this particular video we're doing at the minute then, uh, this fits into uh, that section, or just after that section, and before this section then that, it, that is variation and selection. So there's another video out there on variation and selection. If you haven't watched that, that's that's a different one. So let's move on then. Talking a bit then about then uh, monohybrid inheritance to, re to revise and what we're talking about then. Now here we have a nice example here of uh, monohybrid inheritance. Now again then uh, we have two mice. Now these two mice are two grey mice, and what happens in fact is if you look closely on the, the slide we've got here. Uh, this mouse here, this is this is genotype. If you have a look here, the genotype of that mouse then is is capital B and a small b, and down here as well, the genotype down here is capital B and a small b. Now, excuse me. So we've got two of these mice here. Now we should know then uh, that they are heterozygous mice. Okay, think back to, to the different terms. Homozygous means that the, the two alleles are the same. Don't forget, an allele is a version of a gene. So you might have a gene for the color of the fur in these mice. You could have a, an allele then, which would be the maybe for uh, black fur, and you also have one then maybe for, in this case, brown fur. So uh, there's two different alleles. And uh, so this one here we said at the top, and this, is, this one here is heterozygous. The one down here is also heterozygous. Now, if we think what happens when these two mice breed, at the top then, top we're saying this is, this is the male, male one, okay, it's producing the sperm cells. Now, we know that half of the sperm cells will be a capital B, and half the sperm cells then will be a small b. So, in our Punnett square here, we put those in the boxes at the top. For the female mouse down here, again, we've got then a capital B and we've got then a small b. Now again, if we think here, if that sperm cell fertilizes that egg cell, then of course we have a mouse which has capital B, capital B. If this sperm cell, the capital B, fertilizes this one down here as a capital B, small b. Over here again, we've got then a capital B and we've got a small b. But lo and behold, down here, we've got then a small b and a small b. So what is happening is that the actual then sperm cell, which is carrying the recessive allele, has combined then with the egg cell, which is, which is containing the recessive allele. What happens in this mouse down here, has it ended up then with two of the recessive alleles, so therefore it is homozygous recessive. And therefore it is shown then the, the characteristic this case, what we'll say then is brown fur then. Okay, so even though both the, the father had then black fur and the mother had black fur, we still can see a case then where one in four of the offspring then would be brown fur. Okay, now again, if we think ratio wise here, it's one, two, three, so three of the black ones to one of the brown ones. So we can say there's a, a phenotypic ratio of three black to one brown or three to one. And that's a bit about then these monohybrid crosses. If you don't understand monohybrid crosses, uh, go back then to, to the other, other presentation uh, about the pea plants. But let's move on. So we think a few things about genetic crosses then that we need to remember. One is uh, these are, are ratios. Again, it, it's, it's not definite. So therefore in the last example, if those two mice had four offspring. We're not necessarily saying that three would definitely have black fur and one would definitely have brown fur. It's, it's, it's ratios. You might find, maybe you might, might find all four could have black fur. You might even find maybe that two are black and two are brown. So again, it, it's, it's kind of 
are probabilities, but nothing's really guaranteed here then. Okay. If you if you had more mice, say you had then you say that you had a hundred mice, I'm not sure how it would happen. If you had hundred mice, then you'd find a closer three to one ratio of seventy-five black mice and twenty-five percent then brown mice. Okay, so again, it only really works if you have big big numbers involved. If you think about the original plants by Gregor Mendel, he was breeding hundreds and hundreds of plants, and that's why the ratios were, were quite uh, quite precise then. Okay, also there was a bit of cheating going on, but let's not go there. So we, we've got these these ratios here. Now what else can we say about these? If if the animal is heterozygous, but only then the dominant allele will be shown. So in this case, then the the mice were heterozygous, so we had a capital B and a small b. Now normally we tend then to use the letter of the dominant characteristic. In that case, then it was black, so a capital B would be used normally then uh, when you're discussing these genotypes. Three one ratio. If the parents are heterozygous and a one ratio if one of the parents is heterozygous and the other parent is homozygous recessive so if we then had if we cross then a heterozygous black furred mouse with a brown furred mouse which has two small bees you get a one to one ratio okay so again you can learn the ratios like that or else what you can do probably better is is to draw upon a square issue in the questions and work out what the ratios should be so now Something else which people find difficult is this idea of a test cross. Now, this might be maybe say a gardener has a beautiful red flower, beautiful red rose. And he wants to make sure that, that, that he wants to make the same kind of red rose again and again and again. So he wants, what he wants to find out, he wants to find out then is a red rose homozygous or is a red rose heterozygous? So therefore what you do is you do a, 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 what's called a, a test cross and also sometimes call it a back cross. And this kind of proves the genotype of the parent, whether it was capital B, capital, capital B, or whether it's capital B, small b, for example. Then. So, so it proves the genotype of the parent. It doesn't matter what what, uh, what one you use, you always then cross it with the homozygous recessive. Okay, So that's always the case. Okay, It doesn't matter whether it be a white flower you're going to cross it with or a brown herd mouse. It's always a homozygous recessive. Why? Because we know exactly if, if if it is a brown mouse, for example, we know we're guaranteed that its genotype would be two small bees. So therefore, we might not know what the other one is. We might not know whether the black mouse was homozygous or heterozygous, but we know for a fact then that the brown mouse in that last example has to have been then two small bees. So you, you cross them, you look at the offspring then to see what happens. And again, you can use the, the offspring then to work out the actual then genotype of the parents. So again, this is like what's called test cross. Now let's show an example of what I mean by this. So what I have here then is I have uh, two plants. Now uh, here's a plant here, okay? And this, this say this is one of, of, of Gregory Mendel's pea plants. This in here then happens to be a tall plant. Okay, now just looking at that plant, we wouldn't have any, any idea whether that was uh, homozygous dominant or whether it was heterozygous. Okay, we'd have no idea so looking at that plant then what it happens to be then. However, uh, what we do then is we, we cross it, we breed it then with, with a small pea plant in this case here. Okay, now again, uh, this is one, it, it's not that it hasn't grown yet, this is one which isn't going to get any higher. Okay, so basically this is, this is uh, when they're both mature, the, the one on the left then would be very tall, the one on the right then would be, would be very small. Then, okay, And we know for a fact then that this one here, the short one here, has to have a genotype of small t, small t. Okay, So if we don't know whether or not the other one is a capital T or two capital T's or a capital T and a small t, but we are we know for a fact then that, that this one here has to be uh, two small t's. Then. Okay, so what we do is we cross them. So we get then some pollen from one, we put it on to the stigma of the one, we'd, we'd allow them then to reproduce. Now, if we do that, then what happens is we can look to see what offspring are produced. So this test cross here, really I'm going to show you two different slides here. This is the first one here. So basically down here is one option. And on the next slide here, you'll see the other option then. So if I cross this unknown one at the top here, okay, if I cross this unknown one here with my small one, which I do know, Okay. If I cross this here, well, again, this is a opponent square down here. Again, it might be then you might have two, uh, the genotype might be T, capital T, capital T. 
the genotype that's small one we know is guaranteed two small t's if we cross those then of course that's the combination here they're all all four then are heterozygous but if we look here all of those have a capital t all of those have the allele length of tallness so for all of the offspring produced would all be tall then so we can say there's a ratio then of one to zero so if we do want to work out then the original one here and we cross it and we find out that all of the offspring then were tall that tells us then that it must have been chromocygous dominant it must have been then capital t capital t then okay if that was the case then however if we cross them and we get different results then we must must therefore be heterozygous so when that was homozygous let's have a look then to see what happens if it was heterozygous however if when we cross then the unknown tall plant which we said before must be uh, must be either capital t capital t or else capital t small t when we cross them this time what happens in fact then is if you cross them uh, and you end up then with uh, this combination here where you have half of them are tall and half of them are short well, the only way we can get that one to one ratio is if the actual then plant was heterozygous then so we're saying that that when you cross these if all of the plants were tall in the next generation that would tell us then that all of the, the parent plant was homozygous but if we find that 50 percent of the offspring then are tall and 50 percent are short then that means it must then have been then heterozygous so you cross the parents you look at the offspring and by looking at the offspring you can then determine then what the actual then genotype of the parents actually was then difficult but you'll see lots of examples when you come to the questions so another thing people find difficult then are, are pedigree diagrams these are diagrams which kind of shows how how um how then characteristics and conditions pass through family trees and again it looks a bit like this in here in exams then now what they'll do is they'll, they'll tell you a bit then about about a disease and they'll ask you to work out for example what's the chances of, of somebody having a particular disease then going to do a work example here then now here this one here this one here is actually stolen from, from bbc bite size which is a great resource if, if you haven't been on there what we have then is we've got then um this this one here so again what we have here is we've got this family tree okay this is going to represent the father this is going to represent the mother they have kids here so basically here's the kids here is emily here and abby and thomas and sophie abby then what does abby do well, abby marries theo and what happens is they have they have kids as well their kids are called harry bob carrie and fran okay now this question then is about sickle cell sickle cell anemia now if we think about normal red blood cells we know we know of course normal red blood cells are this kind of shape here okay whereas a sickle cell then is more like this sense we kind of turn that good red blood cell on the side it's it's quite concave looks like this here whereas if we think of a sickle cell well sickle cells look more like this here okay their their surface area isn't as big and therefore they can't carry as much oxygen so we don't really want to have then sickle cell anemia we want to have normal cells then so again what we have in is we're going to we're going to ask a question here we're going to ask a question then what's the chances of bob then of bob having then this these sickle cells okay what's the percentage chances of bob having these cells then so how do we do it well what we need to do is uh, one of the steps people forget about then is they forget then to actually fill in the, the different then genotypes that we actually do know okay so let's let's think here start at the top here it takes a few minutes but let's start at the top here now we have and we've got then alfie has normal cells okay and again they're not really helping us here these are normal red blood cells okay let's 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 choose and let's choose in fact then um a letter for this then so let's choose in fact let's choose sickle cells let's choose then uh, normal okay so he's got normal cells okay now basically alfie and alfie then might have the genotype which is two 
healthy alleles or else what might happen in fact is you might find that alpha then has one healthy allele and one then allele which causes then sickle cell anemia okay now if we have a look here okay if we think here well esme esme then is going to have then she has sickle cell anemia so therefore she must then be homozygous homozygous recessive in this case here esme then must have two of the recessive alleles okay now if then alpha if alpha was homozygous dominant what happened in fact then is if we cross those ones there well if we do a quick cross over here if alpha was homozygous dominant and esme we know then is sorry esme then is homozygous recessive then we'd find that all the children in fact that would be heterozygous then heterozygous and therefore all the children in fact then would have normal cells what we actually do find we find that sophie then and emily both of these two kids in fact do not have normal cells both of these actually have the disease so therefore alfie can't be homozygous dominant he has to be then heterozygous so we now know that alfie must be heterozygous and therefore his is his genotype here okay so alfie we now know it is it's heterozygous capital n small n so an n healthy n allele for normal red blood cells and also has an unhealthy sickle cell anemia allele but again he doesn't show a condition because then he's got the healthy one hiding the the unhealthy one so the, so the normal one is dominant and the sickle cell one is recessive then as we worked out then she has a disease and therefore she must be homozygous recessive here so let's see what others we can fill in well emily emily here we have she must therefore be if she has a disease she must be two small ends sophie what happens in fact is sophie must also be then two small ends okay sorry it keeps doing that again let's think here let's think about thomas well thomas then he has normal cells okay well thomas then uh thomas then could be either homozygous or heterozygous okay now let's think here let's kind of cross this this cross here is going to be then our alfie and esme so let's have a look here so we've now worked out then alfie has to be then this combination here is mum esme this is one here so therefore we've got a couple n small n a couple n small n small n small n small n small n and therefore thomas then must therefore then be heterozygous okay sorry now let's look at abby well abby here abby then is going to be he she, she's got sickle cell anemia so therefore she has to be two small ends now then what happens is we've got theo now theo is coming from outside the family it's abby's married to theo now again then if if theo then was homozygous dominant we've worked it over here if the homozygous dominant then none of their kids would have sickle cell anemia okay whereas uh, some of the kids in fact do have sickle cell anemia okay that tells us then the theo must therefore be carrying the recessive allele so therefore theo then must be be that combination here then okay so again let's think here again well we've almost done it here already if we think here theo and abby well there's theo here okay so there's theo that would be theo's genotype there's abby well that's abby's genotype okay so again we have down here we've got fran over here well fran is going to be then a couple n and a small n because they've got normal cells okay uh carry then will carry is going to be then must be two small ends harry then will harry his normal cells again so therefore he must be then couple n small n the question then is bob then because what's the chances of bob then having sickle cell sickle cell disease in well 50 percent of the kids will be normal 50 percent then will have sickle cell anemia so therefore then bob then has a 50 percent chance of having sickle cell anemia okay and that's how you work it out then not done very tightly admittedly on that on that little slide but you get the idea then so we're saying then that the chances of bob getting it then are 50 percent now uh, you'll be asked then in, in tests and exams how how then you can prove that that's the case and so therefore the kind of the punnet squares i was drawing are the kind of things you need to do then to show exactly why then you know that bob has 50 percent then chance of getting sickle cell and he may then okay so again it's, it's a tricky one there it takes a little, little bit of time but again when you get your head your head around it it will be a bit easier for you then be careful though 
Um, the chances of them having a kid who's got sickle cell anemia is 50%. However, if it says what's the chance of them having a boy with sickle cell anemia, well, you have 50% chance of having a boy, so it's 50% of 50%, which is 25% then. So uh, just be careful how those, those questions are asked then. That's pedigree diagrams. Let's go over some more, more, more straightforward. Let's think about sex determination in humans. Now, I guess there's an easy, easy one here. If we think your fathers are, have an X chromosome and a Y chromosome, mothers have two of the longer X chromosomes. So therefore, when the, the, the father produces sperm cells, half his sperm cells will be X chromosomes. Half those sperm cells will be Y chromosomes. For the mother, well, all the mother's egg cells, and much bigger, all the other egg cells then are all X chromosomes. So therefore then when a kid is produced, if then, if the father's X chromosome has gone with over here and the mother's X chromosome has gone over here, then of course you've got two X's, which of course is a girl. If we think over here, we've got then, here we've got then our Y chromosome this time, the sperm cell, which, which is containing the Y chromosome. It is then fertilized one of the mother's egg cells and therefore you get a, you get then a boy then. So we're saying we have half of the baby, because of course are girls and half babies are boys. So if you look closely then, it's the father's sperm cells. It's a father who determines the sex of the baby. Okay, all the mother's egg cells are all girls. Okay, it's a father's sperm cells which determine then the sex of the baby. Okay, also we can say that the y chromosome is dominant over the x chromosome because if a baby is has both a y chromosome and an x chromosome well what happens then is that the, the person becomes a boy then so that's sex determination then now what's trickier though is when it starts to talk about then some of the diseases carried on the sex chromosome we have a thing called sex linkage now what we have here in fact is we have uh, the sex chromosomes Okay, now again, what we have is this is from, from different people. Okay, so really this is from three different people here. Now, uh, if we think about a normal cell, a normal cell has got 23 pairs of chromosomes. 22 pairs then are, are very, very similar, and one pair might be quite different. Okay, if it's a girl, well, if it's a girl, what happens in fact then is that they will have two long chromosomes. Okay, now if we think about a characteristic, say for example, let's say for the sake of argument that we are talking about eye color here shouldn't use that because it's an A, but at the same time, I, I call here, this, what happens is this girl here and this girl here has got two alleles then saying that she's got brown eyes, for example, okay? This is another girl here. This girl here has an allele maybe saying that she's got she's got brown eyes and one allele saying she's got blue eyes. Whereas over here, the boy then has no, it was only got one X chromosome and one Y chromosome. So therefore, they, what they have, in fact, in my example, is they've got then a allele then which says that they have got blue eyes in this case then. Okay, now again, that's not a good example because um, eye color is not carried on, on these chromosomes. But hopefully you get the idea then. Now, if we think about some things which are sex, sex linked then, these are the conditions which are more common in boys than they are in girls. Now, one example, for example, is where we have color blindness. Okay, more boys are color blind than girls. Um, we'll come back to that one in a second then. And the reason really for that is because if we think here, now say that this is the girl here, the girl here has to have then two faulty alleles, okay? So therefore she would actually need to have here, she'd need to have one one chromosome here, one chromosome here. She'd need to actually have two faulty ones for her, her to have a genetic condition. So she'd need to have two faulty alleles for color blindness, okay? Whereas a boy, then a boy is different. A boy only needs to have one faulty allele for, for color blindness because there's nothing over here. There's nothing over here, in fact, then which which is blocking it out then. So girls, the color blind need to have two faulty alleles, whereas boys only need to have one fault, faulty allele. Okay. So that's what we mean by sex link conditions carried then on on the X chromosome. If we think about an example here, I guess this, is, this one here is to do with, with hemophilia. Okay, hemophilia then is a condition where the blood does not clot properly. Now, in the question, you'll be told then that something is sex linked. Okay, if it doesn't say in the question that it's sex linked, then then ignore the, the X and Y chromosomes. 
However, if it does set its X length, then you need to consider those X and Y chromosomes. So what we have here then is we've got here um, a cross. Okay, this cross here, this cross is between then a healthy man, okay, a man who does not have hemophilia. Now, of course, we know this one at the top is a man because it's X and Y, okay. Now, we said then before that, that the longer X chromosome, well, this longer X chromosome has then the healthy allele. So say here, we've got the healthy allele. Uh, whereas a Y chromosome, of course, is much shorter and therefore it doesn't have that, that section then. Okay, so we're saying here that the longer X chromosome in the man has the normal healthy allele, which doesn't produce hemophilia, whereas the Y chromosome, of course, does not have that then. If we think of the girl, well, the girl, in fact, she is a carrier for hemophilia. She does not have hemophilia. She has the healthy allele and not the unhealthy allele. So therefore, then, she's heterozygous. Now, if we think here, here's the sperm cells, okay? Here's the egg cells. So again, what's the chances of, of having a kid who's got who's got this condition? Well, if we think here, there's if, if we have this um, sperm cell fertilizing this egg cell, then, of course, the baby produced then would be a girl. It would be completely normal. If we think here, if we have, again, the same kind of... of sperm cell and it is fertilizing then this egg cell down here this egg cell and it has has the hemophiliac then uh, allele but the baby which is produced is still a girl two x chromosomes still a girl but because she's got then the healthy allele she will not have hemophilia now she has got both and therefore she's a carrier for the disease so she will have a she's carrying the disease but she doesn't show the disease okay this girl is completely normal Okay, but this one here is completely normal as well, but she's carrying the allele, which says that she'd have the disease if she didn't already have this one here. Then. We, of course, got the boys. Well, XY is a boy, of course. That boy there will not have hemophilia because he's got the healthy allele, whereas this boy here, in fact, on here, has the unhealthy hemophilia allele. So therefore, then, that boy then would, would then have then, would then have hemophilia. Okay, so we're saying really what's the chances of a kid being born who's got hemophilia? Well, there's a one in four chance then. Okay, so again, we can say this is something which happens in boys much, much more likely than it happens in girls. Because I said before, the boys only need to have one unhealthy allele, whereas the girls would need to have, in fact, then two unhealthy alleles then. That's why it's called sex link. So I mentioned them already, color blindness, of course, if you're colorblind, you would not recognize the 29 in there. And if you're hemophiliac, well, your blood would not clot properly then. Okay, hemophiliac, I guess it, I guess it cut, takes an awful long time for that cut to actually heal then. So those are two sex. Now again, those are ones here. Again, there's a few other ones, of course, which we, we know about too. You mentioned hemophilia, we mentioned then cystic fibrosis. That's a big one at the minute because if you have cystic fibrosis, you're more likely to be in danger of of serious harm if you get covid covid 19 so cystic fibrosis is, is one which is on the news a bit more Huntington's disease another one which which kind of older people will get in terms of hunting disease and also then we have down syndrome of course which is caused then by having in fact an, an extra chromosome then these are all diseases caused by genetics now in some countries a lot of people when they're pregnant would have then some kind of genetic screen and it happens it happens in the uk as well uh where people pick they maybe a bit older or maybe there's some kind of a fun history of some kind of disease they might get genetic screening in. what happens then is they might then do an amniocentesis and what this really is is babies in, inside this mother and they'll normally then use uh, use machines so they don't actually inject the needle into the baby of course but what they'll do is they put the syringe then into into the mother they'll then suck out then some of the amniotic fluid. Okay, this amniotic fluid, this fluid contains cells from the baby as well. Okay, as the baby's moving around in there, some some of the skin cells, for example, are, are coming off the baby. When the amniotic fluid, they suck out some of the amniotic fluid, and what they can do is they can test that amniotic fluid, test the, the baby cells from that fluid and see if they have a certain disease in. Now again, it's, it's quite a... Uh, it's quite controversial in, in terms of, of... Some people, maybe if they find that the baby isn't... Uh, isn't maybe healthy, they might then, of course, then might decide to abort the baby. Okay, now again, the worry, of course, is, is where does it stop? In some parts of the world, if the baby has Down syndrome, they, they will abort it. In Scandinavia, for example. And uh, again, then you get this stage in where if they find out that it's a girl 
in some countries they might decide they don't want to want to want to have it as well and so again there's there's various different issues about genetic screening and again there are a few questions in exams asking you then about then um why might someone not want to have um an amniocentesis for example then okay now we're near the end if we think about this this other area of genetics is this area of genetic engineering okay now again uh, this is uh, another commonly asked area and, and you're going to see questions a bit like this in exams they might ask you what's happening at, at different stages here then now if we think here we've got two different cells here one of those cells a human cell here okay and what we have at the bottom is we've got then a bacterial cell now if we think for example this one here if we think about then uh, producing hormones this process has been used for many years for producing insulin but this example here is for human growth hormone people who remember here are, are very small and have dwarfism might then need injections of growth hormone and therefore someone will need to get this from somewhere then what they quite often do is they'll get it then made by these genetically modified bacteria so let's see how it works then so what happens then is we've got the human cell first of all now what they'll do is is that doctors will go in and they remove then some cells from the, the the from a person and what they'll do is they'll look at the, at the actual dna inside those cells what they're going to do is they're going to use enzymes which will specifically cut out the gene for the human growth hormone now uh, they use very specific enzymes okay basically these enzymes are called called restriction enzymes and they will cut specifically at a, at a certain um base sequence okay they, they'll, they'll cut it in a certain way to produce what are called sticky ends which we'll come back to in a minute but we, we cut it specifically at a, a certain area okay what they'll do is going to use the same enzyme to cut then a bit then of of a plasmid okay so what happens in fact is this we've got the human cells we've now cut out the gene from the human cells we've got a bacterial cell in the bacterial cell you've got dna uh but also you've got these rings here this ring of dna here which is called a plasmid they take out that plasmid they use enzymes to cut the plasmid okay so it's been cut out here and therefore what happens in fact is we're left behind them with this kind of cut plasmid and what happens then next is you're going to place the actual then gene for human growth hormone you're going to place that into the plasmid okay there it is up here you can place it in as the plasmid now yeah that's that's easier it's a lot harder sorry than it sounds but they'll put that gene into the the bacterial plasmid they then place it back into a bacterial cell and they allow it then to reproduce all the cells produced from that particular cell will all have the human gene for human growth hormone okay again what they do in fact then is that they, they allow the process to take place uh, and what happens is, is that the bacteria is going to make this in, in a big machine call, called a biofermenter they then remove the actual then um, human growth hormone from the mixture then so bacteria are making it they're producing it and in the big fermenter they're going to have lots of bacteria lots of food lots of oxygen but also of course this human growth hormone so they'll take it out they'll extract it then they will purify it and they'll package it and that's called downstream processing okay and that's how genetic engineering actually works here i mentioned earlier on sticky ends we said these enzymes are restriction enzymes they cut it a specific way again they actually cut it here so here we have here say that was the the um the gene from the human this is the plasmid here and when they put these two things together you're going to find it that they stick together okay because of base pairing there's an a of course is going to combine with the t a t etc etc so it binds together here okay we have been sticky ends and it causes the bind together then. And again that's that's genetic engineering so that's genetics okay that's genetics it's, it's sex linkage it's about then um, genetic engineering and also we mentioned at the very start then about then just revision for monohybrid inheritance and that's that's what i want to discuss with you then today then so hopefully you have understood some parts of that of course uh you need also then to use your your, your revision notes and your your revision textbook your textbook and also of course most importantly to do the past paper questions now once you've got all that done you might know a bit more then about then genetics thank you